Hello everyone, welcome to this tutorial on how to install Kali Linux in our local system using VirtualBox. Now, a VirtualBox is a cross-platform visualization software. It allows users to extend their existing computer to run multiple operating systems, including Microsoft Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Oracle at the same time. So let's start with our installation. Now, to install the Kali Linux, First, go to their website kali.org. Here, click on the download option. And then you have to choose your platform. And as we're running it as virtual machine, so select virtual machine. And here you can select between 64 and 32 bit operating system, depending on your machine specifications. And let's select virtual box as we're running it on virtual box. So now you can download it through torrent or you can directly download it from the browser. It's up to you. I've already downloaded it. So I'm not going to download it again. So let's directly go to the setup. And here you can see I have two files. Both are used to set up the Kali Linux in our virtual box. So now let's add the Kali into our virtual box. Click on the plus sign. Go to the directory where you store the files. And here, select the VBOX file and click OK. Now, Kali Virtual Machine is added to our virtual box and you can see all the details on the right side. Before we start our machine, let's quickly check the settings. So click on the settings option and here you can see all the default settings for this operating system. Now, you can also change the settings according to your need. Let's say if you want to change the system settings, like default memory, it allocates 2 GB, but I would suggest if you have machine with 16 GB of RAM, then you can go with 2 GB of memory for Kali Linux. But if you have 8 GB of RAM, then I suggest you go with 1 GB here. Similarly, if your machine having 8 CPUs, then you can allocate 2 CPUs to Kali. But right now, my machine is running on 4 CPUs, so I'm not gonna give half of them to Kali. It will affect the overall performance of my PC. So I'm going to go with one CPU here. So now let's go to the network and here in adapter one settings, select the NAT network. And then you can choose the default NAT network here and click OK. Now let's start the Kali Linux by pressing start and it will take some time to boot. Okay, so now it's ready and we're going to have to provide the username and password for our machine. And the default username uh, for Kali is Kali and the password will also be Kali. Click login and it will be done. We have successfully completed our Kali Linux setup on VirtualBox. That is it for this video. I hope you like this tutorial on setting up Kali Linux using VirtualBox in your local system. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Bye. Hello and welcome to this lecture on introduction to phishing. Now, phishing is a type of cyber attack that involves tricking individuals into divulging sensitive information such as passwords or credit card details. It can be conducted via email, social media, or even phone calls. Phishing attacks are particularly dangerous because they can compromise an entire network if successful. Now let's see how does the phishing actually works. Now the first thing an attacker will do is that they will send you a phishing email or it could be a message as well that contains the phishing link. Now once the victim open this email and click on the link, it will then redirect to the phishing page. Now a phishing page could be any website page or it could be a Facebook page or if he wants to hack your Facebook account or it could be your Gmail page or your LinkedIn page or any page depends on what information the attacker wants to access. If they want your Facebook access, the page will look similarly or in some cases look exactly like the real website page. And then if the victim will enter their credentials on this fake phishing website, the attacker will then collect this information which in the Facebook scenario would be your ID and your password and use this information to log in on the legitimate website. 
So that's how phishing works. And this is a one use case of phishing. There are many other techniques as well to get victims information. But all in all, that's how generally it works. Here is the example of phishing website and the real website. You can see that both look Facebook pages, but one is legitimate one and the other one is not. Now you can also check which site is real or not by checking the address of the website. See how the address of the phishing website is different from the actual one. The real one has web.facebook.com and the phishing website is www.ckku.com slash includes. So obviously it's not the real website and you should not put your credentials to this website. So that is it for this video on phishing. Uh, I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching and have a nice day. Bye. Hello everyone, welcome to this tutorial on working with DNS commands. Now DNS commands help simplify the way we access websites and services on the internet by using easy to remember names instead of complex numbers. Now when it comes to DNS commands, one of the most common command that we use is ipconfig slash display DNS. And now what it does is it displays the contents of the DNS resolver cache on your computer. The DNS resolver cache is a temporary storage that holds recently resolved DNS records. So now you can see different websites listed here. Like I've got LinkedIn here because it's open in my browser right now. You can have a different website when you run the command. So now what you see here is basically the DNS cache and what will happen is when you visit the website, your computer is actually store the DNS records of this website locally on your machine. The idea here is that if you were to access those websites again, rather than your browser contact your DNS server again, it can simply look within its own DNS cache, find the IP address and quickly connect you to the website. So the DNS cache is basically used to connect faster to website that you visit. Now, if you pay close attention on each website, you have different data records. So you've got record name and record type and time to live. Now, this is important because it shows in how much time this record will be blow out from the DNS cache. And then our browser will have to contact the DNS server all over again to get the IP address for that website. Now let's run a new command, which will be ipconfig slash flush DNS. Now what it will do is it flushes out every DNS records. It's kind of like clearing out your browser cache. And you can do this if you have issue connecting to your internet or issues connecting to your particular kind of website. But you know that the website is actually live. So you can flush the DNS and in most cases, it will actually help. Now, if I run display DNS command again, it will show some of the records of some websites, but I don't see any records from LinkedIn though, because we wiped out that record. But why still have these records like Kubernetes and Docker showing here? That is because of something known as host files. On your window machine, if you can go to the C drive, Windows, System32, Drivers, etc. You'll find a file name host. Right click on it and you can simply edit it with Notepad or Notepad++ and you're gonna see something very interesting here. Now at the end of the file you'll see some websites listed and these are the same website that's shown even after flushing the DNS. Now these right here are the IP addresses that map manually to the domain names. So whenever my browser tries to access these, it is going to use the IP address that retained here in the host file. These are being added manually by us and that's why they'll always be displayed even after flushing the DNS. So now the purpose of manually adding IP addresses to the host file is that Let's say you are migrating your website from one host to another web host. And usually it takes like 24 to 48 hours. 
Now, in the process of moving your website from your old to new web host, you will not be able to access the website. But what you can do is to come over here to your host file and add your website name and then add the IP address of the new web host that you're migrating and then save it. So now your browser will be able to find your new website on your new web host by simply making use of this host file. That is it for this video. I hope you like this tutorial on working with DNS commands. Thanks for watching and have a nice day. Bye. Hello everyone, welcome to this tutorial on Windows Firewall Manager. In this video, I'll give you a quick demonstration on how firewall work in general and we'll use Windows 10 firewall for this demo. So let's start with our lab. Now what you can do is to go to the search bar and search for Windows Defender Firewall and then click on it and it will open the Windows Firewall. This is what you see when you open it. Now here we'll go to the advanced settings and by default on most of Windows machine you have three different kinds of firewall profiles. You have domain profile, private profile and public profile. Now domain profile is for special networks where the host system can authenticate to a domain controller. Usually whenever a computer is added to a network that will be something called as domain controller that will decide whether or not grant a network access to that computer. You also have the private profile which will be your private network or home network and the public profile is for public internet like hotspot or Wi-Fi at hotels or coffee shops etc. Now the thing is every firewall out there whether it is hardware based or software based has this thing called rules. Now right here on the left side we also have some inbound and outbound rules. Now inbound rules filters traffic based on traffic coming into your computer from the outside network which is in this case would be internet. So right here you can see all the inbound rules. So we have the inbound rules for AnyDesk, Skype, Firefox, Redis etc. And also we have some information here as well like the profile. So whether it is enabled for public profile, domain profile or private profile or you can have enable it for all profiles. And then the action right here like whether we are blocking traffic or allowing it. And then you can see the program list and address for the specific rule as well. And we also have some other information here as well. Now same thing applied for the outbound rules which will determine the traffic going outside of my computer onto the network. Now let's go to the monitoring right here and here you can indicate whether or not you want your firewall to monitor your traffic and also log the traffic. So we have got the domain profile, the private profile and the public profile here as well and you can expand all of these. And when you do that, you'll see the general settings like display a notification when a certain program is blocked and it is set to yes. So whenever the program is blocked by firewall, it will notify you as well. And then you also have the logging settings and by default, these are set to no. So you have to actually change it from the property settings. Now to change this right click on Windows Defender Firewall with Advanced Security option and go to the properties and here you can see tabs of different profiles and right here you will see the logging options. Click on customize and then right here you can enable them. So you can switch from no which is default option to yes. And you can do the same for every profile as well. This will allow your firewall to actually log the traffic going in and out of your network. And also typically your inbound connections are usually blocked by default. We will then have to explicitly indicate which connections we want to allow from the inbound. And but all the outbound connections are typically allowed by default since we are the one who accessing the internet. So we are the ones that are fully in control of those kinds of website that we want to access outside of our network. 
Now click OK and go back to the monitoring window. Now here, when you click on the log file, it will show you the log info of that specific profile. And here you can see all the log information like version and software. And right here you can see we have different fields. So we have the date and time and which protocol is being used in source and destination, etc. These logs are very, very useful for inspecting uh, what might happen to particular traffic in network. That is it for this video. I hope you like this tutorial on Windows Firewall Manager. Thanks for watching and have a nice day. Bye. Hello everyone. Welcome to this tutorial on creating sample outbound rule in Windows Firewall. So let's say we want to block all the connections with Google Chrome and we don't want to use Google Chrome to access the internet. So what we can do is we can create a firewall rule that can block all the internet access from Google Chrome. So let's start with our lab. But before we start our lab, let's check that if our Google Chrome is accessing the internet or not. And it is actually connected to the internet and I can access the internet right now. So let's go back to our firewall and go to the outbound rule. And right here on the right side, you'll see the new rule option. Click on it and the dialog box will appear that will set up the new rule for you. Here we can create different kinds of rules like for program and for port or you can make the custom rule as well. Let's go with the program for now. Click on next and right here we have to choose the path to that program. So click on browse and choose the path of that program. For Windows the path generally is C drive, program files, Google, Chrome and the application. And here select the .exe file and click on open. Click on next and here select block all connections and then click next. And here we're going to apply it to all the profiles. So select all the profiles and click next. Let's add the name of the rule. So let's name it Google Chrome test for now and add the description if you want. It is optional and click on finish. And now we've created the rule that will block the internet access from Google. So let's go to our Google page and check it. And now you can see it says your internet access is blocked and this goes with any website that you want to open it here. So we can no longer access any website with Google Chrome. Now let's go back to our rule window and here on the right side, you'll see your newly created rule. Now you can easily disable it or delete this rule from here. So I'm gonna go ahead and simply delete the rule. And then when I go back to the Chrome, now I can see I can access the internet again from the Chrome. So that's how you can create an outbound rule with your Windows 10 firewall. And again, you can apply different rule as well. So for example, if you want to create a rule for port, and you want it to block all the internet traffic that is running on port 80, you can simply select the port and then here add the port 80 and you can actually block all the traffic for this port. And you can apply this method on inbound rule as well. You can do it for the inbound as well. It is pretty much same. Now, the last thing that I want to mention is that when you go to the Windows Defender Firewall, with advanced security. On the right side, you will see two options of import policy and export policy. So if you wanted to grab a policy from another machine to your local machine, you can simply click on import policy and select the policy that you want to import. And the opposite for the export policy, where you can simply export and save your own policy and then later on import it to another machine. That is it for this video. I hope you like this tutorial on creating outbound rules using Windows 10 Firewall. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Bye. Hello everyone. Welcome to this lecture on Network Mapper, which is also known as NMAP.
Now, Nmap is a popular free and open source tool that is used for network exploration and vulnerability scanning. It can be used to discover hosts and services on a network, as well as identify potential security weaknesses. Now, Nmap uses various techniques such as post scanning, OS detection, and version detection to gather information about a target network. Here are some key features for Nmap scans. First, we have port scanning, which determines open ports on target systems and also identifies service running on specific ports. Second, we have host discovery that detects active hosts on a network and determines the availability of hosts. Third, we have service version detection that identifies the specific version and type of services running on target hosts. Fourth, operating system detection uh, that determines the operating system running on target host. And we have network mapping that creates a visual representation of network topology and helps in identifying potential vulnerabilities and weak points. All in all, we used Nmap to explore networks and perform security audits. With Nmap, users can effortlessly discover hosts and services on computer network detect operating systems and identify open ports and collect information about uh, different network devices. And so in the next video, we'll set up and explore more about Nmap and how it actually works. So that is it for this video on Nmap. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching and have a nice day. Bye. Hello everyone. Welcome to this tutorial on how to install Nmap. Now Nmap is a powerful and popular open source network scanning tool used for network exploration, security auditing, and network inventory. It is designed to discover hosts and services on a computer network, thus providing a comprehensive view of network's security profile. So let's start with our lab. First, let's go to nmap.org and here go to the downloads option. Now here you can download the nmap for Windows, Linux, or Macs, etc. Now, for this lab, I'll be running Nmap in my Windows rather than Kali Linux, but you can run this on Kali as well. And in Kali Linux, it is already installed. So you just go to the Kali Linux machine, and there you go to the applications list and search for Nmap, and you should be able to run it from here. Now back to Windows, so click on Windows and then click here to get the latest version of the Nmap. Now you see it is downloading and once the downloading is completed, we'll install it in our PC. Now you can see the downloading is completed, so click on it to install. Click on Agree and then click Next. And then click on Install. Now in the middle of the installing process, if you are installing it on Windows, it will show you this dialog box of installing another application called NPCAP. Now, NPCAP is basically used for capturing packets or packet sniffing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, this is for Windows and you may not get this while installing it on Linux or Mac. I'm gonna go ahead and click on I agree. And here, I check this support raw box as well because we might need this later in our labs. And click on install and wait for the installation of NPCAP. After finishing this installation, Nmap will complete its installation. So wait it till both of the installation will be done. And after that, click on finish. Now the Nmap is installed. Now you can also run the Nmap from the application itself. Or what most of us will do is Go to the command prompt and here type nmap and you will see all the nmap options here. It is kind of like the same information you'll get when you open the application from Kali Linux. So that is it for this video. I hope you like this tutorial on setting up nmap in our Windows machine. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Bye. Hello everyone. Welcome to this tutorial of nmap. So previously we installed Nmap on our Windows machine 
and now we will run it from here. So let's start with our lab. Now before exploring a map, I'm going to type in ipconfig just to get my IP address and IP address of my gateway. Right here, you can see my IP address is 192.168.52.6 and here we have the IP address of the default gateway as well. So let's start with the most basic nmap command, which is nmap itself. And here it will give us all the required information about nmap. And at the very top right here, you can get the basic syntax of how nmap command actually is structured. So you're going to have nmap first of all, and then you're going to have the scan type, which we will cover it in a bit. And then you have options like, do you want light scan or do you want your scan more deeper and thorough? And then you have the type of specifications like which IP address and which host are you actually targeting with this command. Now, as you're working with Nmap, keep in mind the reason why we are using it because we want to be able to scan the networks find out what IP addresses are active on a network and then find out what ports are open or closed on each of the hosts on that network. So here, when you scroll down, you'll see these options like target specifications. So we can use host names. Host names are like actual website address like microsoft.com or youtube.com, etc. And we can target IP address or networks as well. Next, you have the host discovery option where you can list a target to scan or disable port scan things like that. And now down here, you have the scan techniques. Now, these are the types of scans we can actually run. Like uh, we can run a TCP scan or UDP scan to find out what UDP services are running on a particular host. And down here, we can have the port specification as well. So we can also scan ports within a particular range. You also have the service version detection where we can try to determine what version of service is running on each port. We have the script scan as well. And we even have the OS detection here where we can detect what operating system would be running on each particular host. And you have so many other options as well down here. Now let's run a very basic command right here. So to do that, let's copy my gateway IP address first, and then I'll simply type nmap and paste my default gateway and press enter. So as you can see, this is by far the most basic command and is basically telling that the host is up. And if we do have a 999 closed ports and only one port is right now open, which is port 53. And we also have the MAC address right here as well. Next, I'm going to nmap my IP address, which is this. So just copy it and paste it down here. And now here we have 997 closed ports and three ports that are open. Now let's try something else. Let's run a particular command for service detection which is going to be nmap dash s capital V and then my own IP address. And let's see what results it will give us. Now our scan is completed and here you can see it gives us the kind of service and its version as well that is running on our particular computer. So you see that you can run multiple different kinds of scan. So like you want to run UDP scan or TCP scan, or you want to run a very deep or light scan. We'll also take a look at these techniques later as well. So that is it for this video. I hope you like this tutorial on the basics of Nmap. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Bye. Hello everyone. Welcome to this tutorial on host discovery controls used by Nmap. So by default, when you run the nmap and then the target IP address, there are three types of information that nmap acquires. First of all would be the IP address of the target. 
which in this case uh, we already have it so it's not gonna tell us in this case second information is that what IP addresses are actually used by active machines so we know how many hosts are up and running on the network and the third is would be what ports are open or closed on each one of those target machines now the problem with this type of scan is that it can be quite interrupting like you run this scan against uh, like facebook.com or google.com etc and there is a very strong possibility that the intrusion detection systems on such networks might block your scan so to cater that and map has offers different ways of making our scan less intrusive or in other words it gives us ways to perform stealth scans now these scans gives us information about our target without alerting the firewalls or the intrusion detection systems on those networks now the first one here is list scan so type in the following command and map dash sl facebook.com and then forward slash 24 so what it does that it doesn't run an ping command or and it doesn't run any port scan either the goal here is just to figure out what IP addresses are actually available on our target which in this case is facebook.com and here are the result of IP addresses used by facebook.com and when you scroll down a little bit, you'll see some very interesting devices being listed like WhatsApp chat. So this could be a, one of the server of WhatsApp. And we have Instagram here as well and all the other devices as well. And we know that the IP address is being used by these devices. Now the second stealthy scan is the disable port scan. So type in the following command nmap-sn facebook.com slash 24 now the idea behind using this scan is that we are trying to figure out which IP address are actually in use so when we run the list scan notice at the end of the scan it says 256 IP addresses are in use but it says zero hosts are up and the reason being that because we run the list scan so nmap did not try to figure out which hosts are active by sending a port scan or ping scan so it just tells us the IP addresses are available on the network so when you disable a port scan with the minus sn it will tell us not only the IP addresses but gives us the information about which IP addresses are in use by active machines so the SN in my experience is the most used scan because it gives us the enough information about our targets without alerting the firewall or the intrusion detection system. And down here you can see that 90 hosts are up. Now there is another scan that we can use which is nmap-pn facebook.com slash 24 which is by the way the network range. So this scan we can call the disable ping scan. So basically here we are trailing nmap to skip discovering whether or not the IP addresses are in use and just pretend that every single IP address on this target is alive and running. So then we can start to run the port scan immediately on the target. So with this scan nmap is not looking whether this machine is up and running or not it just go immediately scan which ports are open or closed. So this kind of scan is very intrusive and a hacker only run this kind of scan when he knows that this particular target has these IP addresses that are up and running. So nmap then don't go for IP addresses. It'll just go ahead and run the port scan. And the second reason to run that kind of scans is to check whether the firewalls or the intrusion detection systems are working or not. So that is it for this video. I hope you like this tutorial on host discovery controls used by nmap. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Bye. Hello everyone. Welcome to this tutorial on different types of scanning techniques in nmap. So now we know the host discovery controls, we will begin how we are going to conduct our scans. 
do we want to run TCP scans or are we going to scan UDP ports and things like that. So right here we have these different types of scan techniques. So now when you use Nmap, you run TCP sync scan or the UDP scan very frequently. So let's start with the TCP sync scan. So type in the following command and map and I'm gonna target my own computer right here and then type minus S and capital S. Now this is the default scan that Nmap typically uses and it also the best because it, it is extremely quick and very stealthy scan. Now there is another scan that you can run which is the TCP connect scan. Now the above scan requires the admin privileges in order to create the packets and that it will send to the ports on the target. Now in a scenario where you don't have the admin rights, you can use the TCP connect scan that you can run as an alternative to sync scan. Now the problem here is that with this scan, Nmap is not going to be the tool that will create the packets for testing. Nmap will ask the operating system to create the packets on its behalf and then ended up condensing those packets to the ports. So this is gonna take way more time than the above scan. And it is a lot easier for firewalls and intrusion detection systems to detect this. Now the next kind of scan is UDP scan. Type in nmap scanme.nmap.org and then dash su space dash f. Now if you're looking for a particular target to scan, this is a good one for learning purposes. You can just scan this scanme.nmap.org and this is officially from nmap themselves. Now the dash f I put because it is way to conduct the scan more quickly as now it's going to scan the top 100 ports that it sees on the target. So here it is showing 97 closed ports and 3 ports that are open. So if you ever want to run UDP scan quickly, you can use minus F. Now the other scan that we will run is nmap scanme.nmap.org dash su dash p68 to 150 space dash sv. So what it will do is it will scan only these ports numbers that we have specified. So this is me specifying what port number should be scanned. And then the SV is going to be the service version. So I'm not only running this scan just to see which ports are open, but to see what services are running on these ports as well as the version. And you can see we have two ports that are open and we now have the service and the version as well. So these are the types of information that hackers can use to begin to find weaknesses and vulnerability on the particular target. Now there are two other ones that you should be aware of. The first one is nmap and a use my IP address minus A. Now this is what we use to enable operating system detection, version detection, script scanning, etc. And this is very intensive kind of scan that you can run on live targets. Now, as you can see, we have the results like number of closed ports and number of our open ports, the version numbers as well. And then you have the operating system and its details, uh, the network distance. And right now it shows zero hops, which means that we're basically scanning our own machine. And then you have the service information right here. Now this kind of scan can take some time but will give you a plenty of information. Now if you want more streamlined version of this, you can use minus O. And in this scan, we basically just look for the operating system information that is running on the target. And as you can see, we have less information than the above one and we just have the information related to the operating system. So that is it for this video. Now there are more scanning techniques as well that you can check. I've just shown you some famous ones. 
so you can check them out by yourself. I hope you like this tutorial on scanning techniques using Nmap. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Bye. Hello everyone. Welcome to this tutorial on working with firewall and IDS evasion and spoofing techniques. Now IDS is the short form for intrusion detection system. Now the reason why Nmap has these list of options is because firewalls and ITSs can take a pretty good guess when a particular packet is coming especially from Nmap. Even if you're using very stealthy kind of scans like TCP sync scan, which is very stealthy kind of scan, you still have network admins and security admins that can configure the firewall to specifically look for these kind of packets coming from Nmap scans. So if you want to scan like a hacker, you have to use these kind of techniques. Now the first one here is fragment packets. Every time Nmap props a port number or an IP address, that prop itself is a packet and it consists of a particular kind of size and firewall can guess that, okay, this particular traffic is coming from Nmap based on the size of its packets. Now, one thing we can do is that we can fragment those packets and make them smaller so that it becomes difficult for firewalls to detect that packet is coming from Nmap. So we can type in this command Nmap minus F and I can simply add my target IP and press enter. And now it shows a warning that says packet fragmentation selected on a host older than Linux open BSD, etc. This may or may not work. So they gave us this warning because sometimes it will work. But in my experience, it I didn't got any of this issue with this. So here is our result. We got our result, but the packets sizes are now fragmented by using dash F. And also one thing we could do is that we can define our own packet sizes based on multiples of 8. So for that, type in command nmap dash dash mtu and then I define packet size like 16 and my target IP and press enter. And there you go, we got pretty much the same result but now the packet size for this scan is 16. So these are the two ways that we can fragment our packets. Now, another method that we can try to evade firewalls and intrusion detection systems is to use something known as decoys. So type in nmap and now minus D, that's for decoy. After that, we can add a bunch of IP addresses and then at the end, we can now indicate our actual target. And this could be an IP address or the regular domain name. So let's go with scanme.nmap.org. Now what will happen is that if the firewalls of scanme.nmap.org see this particular scan, they cannot guess the scanning coming from which IP address as we now use decoys in our scanning. But our actual IP address will still be included in the actual scan itself because now because how Nmap will give us the result if it doesn't use our IP address. So our actual IP address will still be included. Now note that in real world, the security admin still track the actual source of the scanning back to your own IP address. And they can do that by simply retracing the path of the packets. And it's not difficult at all. And also make your decoys that you're using are actually live and active on the network. Because if you're using just random IP addresses that are not even active, it will not be difficult at all for the network admins to know that these are decoys because they are not active. So what hackers are actually doing in the real world that they can use the IP addresses of virtual systems or they can use the IP addresses of their own router or their mobile phone, etc. So they would use those as the decoys for the scanning. Now, one more method that I want to show you when it comes to trying to evade firewalls and intrusion detection systems is by spoofing the port number. 
So when the firewall see traffic coming from a particular port number, there are certain port numbers that they trust. And a very good example is port 53, which is used by DNS. So there are four main type of services that are really trusted by firewalls and IDSs. So you have a DNS that uses port 53, FTP that uses port 20, uh, DHCP that uses port 67 and Kerberos that uses port 88. These are the ideal port numbers that you should use whenever you're trying to spoof the port number with nmap. So type in nmap-g and then we have to specify port number and I'm using port 53 here and then choose the target. So now nmap is basically use port number 53 to try to scan our target. So these are some of the techniques that you can use to evade firewall and intrusion detection systems. That is it for this video. I hope you like this tutorial on firewall and IDS evasion techniques. Thanks for watching and have a nice day. Bye. Hello everyone, welcome to this tutorial on calculating the hash values of different types of files by using Microsoft PowerShell. Now PowerShell is an open source program and it is available on Mac and Linux as well. So you just have to worry about that. All you need to do is to type in the PowerShell in your browser and then go to the documentation and from here you can download the latest version of the PowerShell. Now I already have it because I'm using Windows so I'm not going to install it again but you can first set up the installation and then resume this tutorial. Now run the PowerShell. You can either open its application or another way is to just go to the command prompt and type in PowerShell and press enter. And it now says PS which means now we're in PowerShell and PowerShell is active. Now, before going forward, one other thing that I have done is I have made a folder in my C drive named as files. And in that folder, we have a couple of images with .jpg extension and we have an mp4 video and a PDF file. And we're going to calculate the hash values of these different kinds of files. Now, let's go back to the command prompt and let's first navigate the folder which has all these files by using cd command. Now, once you have it, then type in the following command, get dash file hash, and then we will add our first file, which is going to be video.mp4. Then we have to add another command, which is format dash list, and then press enter. So now you can see the algorithm that is being used is SHA-256, which is the default algorithm. And there is the hash value for that mp4 file. So you can convert any kind of file into hash value. It's not just text or strings. You can do it with audio files or video files or images, etc. Now let's do it with another file, which will be final.pdf file. So just change the name of the file here and press enter. And there you go. This is the hash value for final.pdf file. Now, what if we don't want to select the default algorithm and we want to change the algorithm to, let's say, MD5 instead of SHA-256. So to do that, I'm going to simply repeat the same command, but after the file name, I will define which algorithm I'm going to use here. So I'm going to type dash algorithm space and then the name of the algorithm, which is going to be MD5. So that is the way to use another algorithm instead of a default one. And there you go, you have the value for MD5 algorithm. Now let's create a hash value for the image name beer.jpg with MD5 algorithm. And now there you go, we have the result for this file. And let's again run the same command but this time for second image, which is plain.jpg. And now we have the hash value for plain image as well using MD5 algorithm. Now sometimes it happens that if you're not using the default algorithm, the algorithm you selected can give you the same hash values for two different files. 
and this concept is known as collision. It is not common and you barely face this kind of problems, but it can happen. So to create hash values, I would recommend the default algorithm, which is SHA-256. Now we use hashing for our integrity verification. So let's suppose if you send a file to a friend of yours, so you give them the file and the hash value for the file. So when they get the file, they can then cross check the image and the hash values. And they check that indeed this is the same file because the thing is if you go to my file or image and I make slightest change here like very small and unnoticeable change the SHA-256 will then give a different value for that particular image. So that is it for this video. I hope you like this tutorial on calculating the hash values of different type of files by using Microsoft PowerShell. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Bye. Hello everyone. Welcome to this tutorial on setting up Hashcat. Now when it comes to launching brute force attacks against passwords, one of the very best tool out there is Hashcat. It is free and you can download it in your Windows or Mac. Just go to the hashcat.net website and here you have to download it for the binaries and then the zip file will be downloaded. Extract the file and it will look like this. And when you open this folder, you'll see all the files here. Now I've created three more files inside this folder. First one is file1.txt and the second one is file2.txt. These are basically text files that contains different kinds of words as you can see. And I created myself and it will be shared with you or if you want to create it by yourself, you can do that as well. Now we need these files to launch the brute force attacks to crack the password. The third one is hash.txt. This is empty for now, but this will contain the actual MD5 hash value that we will try to crack. Now let's go to the browser and here you can go to the miraclesalad.com slash webtools slash md5.php. Here we can generate the hash for our password and I'm going to set the password that we will crack is cipher. And this right here is our md5 hash value. So I will just copy this and paste it on my hash.txt file and save the file. Now let's go to the command prompt and first we have to navigate the file. Once we are in the hashcat directory, type in this command hashcat.exe h. Now this is the help command and when you press enter, it will show all the details of the options of hashcat. Now there are a lot of options that we can try, but the most important ones are going to be M and A options. And when you scroll all the way down here, these are the different types of hashes that we can try to crack. It's not just MD5, but there are many more options that we can try as well. Now the A option uh, will signify the kind of attack we want to run. Right here, you have the attack models like straight, combination, brute force attack and more. Now one last thing we have to do is since this is the password that we are trying to crack, we have to make sure that this word will be included in our file as well. Otherwise, we will not be able to crack the password. So I'm going to copy this and paste it in my file1.txt file and save the file. Again, this is for the testing purposes and we want to make sure that the hash cat will crack the MD5 hash. So that is it for this video. I hope you like this tutorial on setting up hashcat. After that, we will start to crack the passwords with hashcat. Thanks for watching and have a nice day. Bye. Hello everyone. Welcome to this lecture on introduction to web security. Now web security refers to the practice of protecting websites, web applications and web servers from unauthorized access, data breaches and malicious attacks. It involves implementing measures to ensure the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of web resources. These are crucial to protect sensitive information such as user data or financial transaction and confidential business data. 
Breaches in a web security can lead to identity theft, financial loss, and reputational damage or legal consequences. Now let's look at the common web security threats. The first one is cross-site scripting that involves injecting malicious script into web pages viewed by user, allowing attackers to execute unauthorized action, steal data, or hijack user sessions. A second one we have SQL injection that occurs when attackers insert malicious SQL statement into web application inputs, exploiting vulnerabilities to manipulate or extract data from the underlying database. The third one we have cross-site request forgery. Now CSRF attacks trick authenticated users into unknowingly execute unwanted actions on a web application potentially leading to unauthorized operation or data modifications. Now, web application security tools like Perp Suite plays a crucial role in identifying vulnerabilities, testing web application security, and ensuring robust protection against attacks. These tools assist in detecting and mitigating potential risks, enhancing the overall security posture of web application. In the next video, we'll set up the Burp Suite and explore more of its functionalities. That is it for this video on Introduction to Web Security and Burp Suite. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching and have a nice day. Bye. Hello everyone. Welcome to this tutorial on setting up Burp Suite. Now, Burp Suite is a very powerful tool in which you can scan for vulnerabilities on a website. And it is very commonly used in ethical hacking and pen testing industry. Now, Burp Suite has three different versions that you can use. You have the Enterprise Edition, the Professional Edition, and then you have the Community Edition. Now, the Community Edition is the free edition, and you can use this edition to get started with the Burp Suite. But at some point, it will not be enough for you, as it is very basic version, and you can't do much using this version. Now for this lab, I'm using professional edition and you can also use this version for one month as a free trial. So I've downloaded the professional version as a free trial for 30 days. Now let's install it. Double click on it and click on next. And then again, click on next and wait for installation. And after that, click on finish and now it is installed. So when you download it for the first time, you need to add the license key file which they gave you when you download this tool. Now before we started with this tool, we're going to work with another tool known as Foxy Proxy. And I'm using Firefox browser for this as I don't use this browser very much. So I recommend you to do the same. Use the browser which you don't often use. So search for Foxy Proxy and you'll see add-on for this. Now click on add-on and you'll see it will be added to your browser. Click on it and you'll see something like this. Now you might be thinking, why are we using this tool? Now the reason for using this tool is it is basically allowed us to activate Bulb Suite with our browser conveniently. So now I'm going to go ahead and click on options. And now we have to add Bulb Suite into Foxy Proxy to integrate them together. So click on add option. Now we can add the title and over here, the proxy type will be HTTP and the proxy IP address would be 172.0.0.1 and the port is going to be 8080. And now go ahead and click save and there you go. So now we have a bulb suite active and if you go here, you'll see bulb suite now available for us to use if you choose to do so. Now let's go back to the Burp Suite tool and here for now we're not doing any new projects so we're just working with a temporary project. So click on next and here for now we're simply using the defaults. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the Burp Suite. And there you go. This is exactly you'll see when you launch a Burp Suite. So right here you have the event log and you can see the date and time and the source says proxy and the service started on this IP address with that port number. So this site here shows that we successfully integrated Burp Suite with Firefox.
And this is basically the UI for the burp suite. So on the left side, you can see what tasks are running and pause and finished. And on the right side, you can see the issues activity. So that's how you can install the burp suite and integrate with Foxy Proxy. That is it for this video. I hope you like this tutorial on setting up burp suite. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Bye. Hello everyone, welcome to this tutorial on installing Multigo. Now if you're running uh, Windows or Mac, you have to install it. You have to f first download it from Multigo official website. But if you're running Linux like me, so Multigo is already installed in Kali Linux. But if you don't want to use Kali Linux, you can also download it from their official website if you're using Windows or Mac. That's just fine. So I'm gonna use it in Kali Linux for now. So let's go to my applications and search Multigo. So let's go ahead and now launch Multigo. And uh, this is what it looks like when you first open uh, your Multigo. Okay, so this is gonna be the first screen that you will see when you open it. So now you will see different versions of Multigo. So you have paid versions of Multigo and then you have community editions and case file. So right now I'm going to go with community edition because it's a bit more powerful than uh, the case file edition. So I'm going to go with the Multigo community edition. Okay, so first accept the agreement and then click on next. And in the next page you have uh, you have to provide the login information. So if you are doing it for the first time, you first have to register yourself. So right here you have the link to register yourself. So you can just click on the link and then uh, do the registration process and then you can log in from here. So I've already registered with uh, Multigo, so I'm not gonna do it again. So I'm just gonna put my information, put my login information here and then click on next. So now the login is completed, so just wait for the process and then click on next. And then click on next again. So automatically send error report, we're not gonna check that, so click on next. And here you have to choose the web browser, so click here and you'll see the option. So click on the browser that you wanna select and then click on finish. So this is the very first page, the home page for Multigo. So the first thing I'm going to do here is that right here, you can see the case file entities. So click here and install the case file entities. So now it's finished and now we're good to go. So now let me give you a very quick introduction of how Multico works. So right here, we have the option of a, create a new graph. So click on it. So graph is where we plot our attack or get the information that we wanted. So this is the graph that we will do our, all of our plotting. So on the left side, this right here is what we call entity palette. So this right here is where we can begin to grab the information about our potential target. And then we can run something known as transformation in order to gather some specific information. So let me just give you an example. So if I go to the infrastructure and down here, we have this thing called website. So I'm going to just drag and drop this website into our graph. So there you go. Now, right here, we have like, we have the default uh, website, which is multigo.com, but we can change it. So click on it. And on the right side, you have the property view. And here you can actually change the website name. So I'm gonna change it from multigo.com to let's say www.udemy.com and click enter. So there you go. Now you have the Udemy site on your graph. So now the Multigo is specifically targeting the Udemy website. And this is our entity. So if I right click on this entity, you can see some transformation that we can run to gather some specific information from this website. So let me run one transformation, which is to domain DNS to convert this to an official domain. So let's run this transformation. 
And there you go. So Multico now fully resolves www.udemy.com into udemy.com by itself. So now if I right click on udemy.com, you can see some other transformation as well that you can run on this domain. So this is exactly how Multigo works. You can just go to the entity palette on the left and grab the entity and then you can run transformation on that entity. So the other thing is that you can save this graph to work it on later. So click on save as button and then you can select the directory where you want to save and then choose the name. So I'm going to go with Udemy right now and click on save. So that is it for this video. I hope you like this tutorial on installing and running Multigo. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Bye. Hello everyone. Welcome to this tutorial on getting information using Multigo. So in the previous tutorial, we install and run the Multigo. So now we know how Multigo works. So now let's try to gather as much information as we can. So let's start with our lab. So one of the key bits of information that we want to gather is the emails that are associated with Udemy.com. So now with Multigo, when you right click here, you can see we have email addresses from domain. So click on it and run the transformation and let's see how many emails that we can get from Multigo. And there you go. We have uh, two email addresses that are linked with udemy.com. So before running further transformation, let's do some digging. So I'm going to go to my LinkedIn account and I'm going to search both of these persons. So first, uh, let's search for Robert Neal, which is the first email address that we got uh, from Multigo. So if I click on his profile, so we can see that this person indeed work with Udemy in the past. And if I search for other person, which is Paul Cho, we can see that this person was also work with Udemy.com in the past. And we can also gather some more information from both of these person like email addresses and phone numbers, etc. Again, the point here is that we're trying to gather as much information as we can in order to craft something like phishing email and send it to them. Okay, so let's go to our graph and let's run some more transformation. So I'm going to go with now phone numbers. So let's see if we can find out uh, some phone numbers related to this website. So click on to phone number and run this transformation. And there you go. So we got three phone numbers that are linked to udemy.com. So now let's right click on it and let's uh, run some more transformation. Uh, for example, like the DNS name. So if you run this transformation, you will have all the DNS server as a result. And if you run to files transformation, uh, you have the files that could be related to udemy.com. So all of these are files that can be linked to udemy.com. So we have like course description and schedule and things like that. So that's how you can gather as much information as you can using Multigo. So once you have all the information about a specific website, then you can perform your attack, maybe like phishing or something like that. So that is it for this video. I hope you like this tutorial on gathering information using Multigo. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Bye.